Together with a team of emergency medicine doctors and nurses from Stanford, under the auspices of International Medical Corps, I joined first responders from around the globe to respond to Haiti after the January 2010 earthquake. Please let me take you into the day-to-day -day operations of our disaster relief efforts and point out some of the many lessons we learned. My hope is that, as a business leader, you'll gain a better understanding of what's needed in such situations and determine how you can best help. This story started on the 12th of January with the earthquake that we're all aware of, a 7.0 earthquake that was centered very close to Port-au-Prince. It was a devastating event. Uh, the next day we were sitting in a faculty meeting at Stanford uh, of emergency medicine physicians. A couple of us got phone calls. We looked at each other and said, I guess we're going. We got close to the border and came to a small hospital on the Santa Domingo side and it gave us a glimpse of what we were going to face. There was one nurse managing approximately 100 patients that night because the physicians were exhausted. What we encountered was fairly horrific. Uh, the damage was extensive. There was hardly a building left standing. And there was a fair amount of unrest. We entered what was the University Hospital in Port-au-Prince. I have to tell you that it's really a university hospital in name only. It really wasn't much of a place before we got there, but now it was really devastated. We unpacked supplies on the spot, started loading up our duffel bags with everything we could think of. There was one little operating room working where there were some folks from Partners in Health. We faced 800 to 1,000 critically injured people with amputations, spinal cord injuries, head injuries, uh, gangrene. We were out of supplies. For those first three days, we barely had narcotics, pain medicine, we had some antibiotics. Then the military came, and I'm, I just have to tell you right now that God bless the U.S. military. Um, uh, they did everything we asked and more. Um, they were our supply chain. Um, they were our only effective supply chain. The USNS Comfort came, which was a hospital ship. We started to transfer patients out to the Comfort. And again, just to demonstrate how wonderful the military was, this poor child had lost her ear. She had a facial infection. She'd been operated on by the Swiss surgeons. And so she needed to go to the comfort. At that point, parents and family weren't allowed to go. So she had to go by herself. And eventually, one of the senior officers, who's also an RN, took her with her and took her over there. I ran as hard as I could. I worked fixing generators. I coordinated tents going up. I snuck away every once in a while to see patients because now I'd become a hospital administrator and, and never done that before and, and, and missed taking care of patients. So I wanted to keep doing that. Um, and we had marvelous help. The Mount Sinai uh, had sent a surgical team in. Uh, the Swiss surgeons were remarkable operating on, on children. The Norwegians were very, their supply chain management was outstanding. The Norwegian Red Cross, the Canadian Red Cross got us tents, got us stretchers, got us medications. A few lessons now about what we went through with supply chain. From our perspective, it's really important if you do this to have someone on the ground to receive and shepherd the supplies. When you send stuff off in a plane, Unless you're with it and you take it to its final destination, you have no idea where it's going. Be ready ahead of time. Multiple methods of moving supplies. Anything you set up will fail. We have a saying in the emergency department that if you put a bowling ball in the emergency department, it either gets broken or stolen. Uh, the, you have to be prepared to improvise in these situations. Know how to work with all the agencies that you might have to work with, and particularly the ones for disaster response that are relevant. Stay current in the politics of what is going on at the scene. That's important. I had to know who to call and who had authority in a disaster situation. You need food, water, shelter, clothing, and medications. And finally, you need communications. And if you take care of those, that's what we need in a disaster. Things improved over the week. Uh, we got uh, help from many NGOs like the Canadian Red Cross, the Norwegians, the Spaniards. We evolved from big bladders of water to an actual water system. We got food in. Uh, we got sanitation. That was quite difficult. As a leader, this is what benefited me the most, was having one person in charge. I made some good decisions. I made some bad decisions. But it wasn't time for a whole lot of committee work, particularly when we had multiple languages, multiple systems to coordinate. We had meetings, regular meetings, to review activities, and so everybody was in the loop. 
Use praise as currency. People are there as volunteers. They're not there because they want to get paid. With the media, nothing is off the record. Remember that you're there for the victims and not vice versa. The lessons we learned were to stay personally ready to deploy, have your immunizations and your passport ready to go, make sure your gear is ready to go. Communication is integral to every function. For those of you that do supply chain management, uh, if bring in communications equipment. We went two weeks without telephones or effective communications. I got a stress fracture in my foot from running around that compound. A disaster is a distance event, not a sprint. So you have to be prepared to bring teams in and be in and be out. This was our team from Stanford. Uh, this is a bond that will carry forever. You work under these kind of circumstances. I knew they were good. I didn't know they were, they were this great. The Haitian people were remarkably strong and did everything they could to try and help us. If you think about why they're so strong, it's because this wasn't the first time they've ever faced adversity. They face adversity every day of their life. They're doing the best they can, and they deserve all the support we can give them. So uh, thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Disasters aren't going away. In the context of global warming, we're likely to encounter more floods, Category 5 and 6 hurricanes, and wildfires. I hope that you are willing to assist, because in a disaster, your actions may certainly help to save lives. For more information about how you might be able to help, please contact me at auerbach at stanford.edu.